I love the <laughs> I love that the deer just stare at her like lady is scaring us. I'm Jim Fritz. I need all you dozens of viewers out there to just tell me how you like this, alright? Hey kids, it is my favorite time of year. You wanna know why? No, 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 it's not what you think. It's not the bitter blister and cold or the part where my skin is so dry that it bleeds. It's not being horrifically shocked by static every 10 seconds or the fact that it gets dark now at 2 p.m. No, no. The reason that this is my favorite time of year is because this is the season when Netflix puts out apocalyptic thrillers. You know, just to make us a little bit more anxious than we already are. And this year they absolutely did not disappoint when they released Leave the World Behind, which is a, you know, doomsday thriller starring Julia Roberts, Ethan Hawke, Mahershala Ali, Kevin Bacon, and uh, these kids. So this film is based on a book, a novel, if you will, of the same name. And the gist is, a family's getaway to a luxurious rental home takes an ominous turn when a cyber attack knocks out their devices and two strangers appear at the door. Ooh, sounds promising, but isn't, isn't promising in my opinion. But I wanted to talk about it with you guys because I just know that this one is gonna be one that is very divisive and sparks a lot of conversation. I'm very, I'm really looking forward to hearing your opinions on this film. Now there's a lot of symbolism in this movie, a lot of uh, socio-political overtones. They deal with race stuff. It was actually produced by Barack and Michelle Obama, which is unique. There's a lot of opinions on that. And I'm very happy to tell you guys that if you came here looking for an intelligent, eloquent, thoroughly researched deep dive on this film as usual, you are in the wrong place. There's plenty of like smart people out there that would have really cool stuff and deep stuff to say about this film, but people who come here, they come here for the fart sound effects. So friends, this is a long one, okay? Grab some snacky poos, get cozy. You might need an energy drink. I certainly do to get through this script. And let's get ready to face the end of the world together right after today's wonderful sponsor. And now a word from our sponsors. You know what kids, it's a really good day today. Wanna know why? Cause I just got notified that my Thrive Market order hath shipped, which means I'm just a day or two away from all of these delicious, low carb, healthy, sustainable, affordable snacks that I purchased with my most recent purchase. Side note, I should probably tell you what Thrive Market is if you don't know instead of just babbling about how great it is. So Thrive Market is an online grocery store, meaning you don't have to go into a building and see people. They have an amazing selection of organic groceries, snacks, supplements, beauty items, cleaning supplies, organic kids products, wine, meat, seafood, frozen veggies, and more. Basically, they have everything that you could ever want and they are on a mission to make healthy living easy and affordable to everyone. So as I mentioned a second ago, I ordered a bunch of low carb stuff recently. I get a ton of stuff from there, but recently I used the feature they have where you can filter your results by diet or lifestyle and I selected the keto option and I got so excited because they have so many convenient low carb snacks with minimal ingredients. I also stocked up on my essentials that I talk about in every single one of my Thrive Market videos. My Wandering Bear decaf cold brew, my Truffle Hound hot sauce, my little kids coconut oil bamboo bandages that my nephews love. I'm really excited for this keto soup I got by Kettle and Fire. Didn't know that existed, wouldn't have known without Thrive Market. So friends, as a Thrive Market member, you will save money on every single order of the highest quality organic and sustainable products. And if you find a lower price somewhere else, they will match it. I honestly don't know how much better Thrive Market could actually get. We are obsessed with it in this household. So if you're interested in checking out Thrive Market, having your delicious groceries shipped right to your door, you can go to thrivemarket.com slash Jamie French. Be sure to spell my name correctly and you will get 30% off your first order plus a free gift worth up to $60 hairs. Friends, as Jennifer Coolidge would say, what are you waiting for? Head to thrivemarket.com com slash Jamie French today to save 30% on your first order and receive a gift worth up to $60. Thank you so much Thrive Market for sponsoring a portion of today's video. I love you so much and my truffle hound hot sauce. And now back to the show. So the opening scene of this flick is Ethan Hawke's character Clay waking up to his wife Amanda. Amanda? Played by the lovely Miss Julia Guglia. I mean, Julia Roberts. So as Amanda is standing in her very blue room, uh, putting blue clothes into her blue-ish suitcase. We find out that she spontaneously booked a trip for her and her family. I went online this morning and I rented us a beautiful house out by the beach. Right off the bat, I know, I'm so nitpicky, I know. The opening sentence of the movie just felt so contrived and so 
over explainy, you know? And I just seem to be working every day without even realizing it. And you are just constantly anxious about your job because of all the budget cuts. Yeah, you know, the budget cuts that occurred at the college where you work as a professor. And so I, your wife of 24 years and mother of your two children, Rosie and Archie, decided we should take a little vacay. I don't know, it's damn for a little vacay, especially with the kids. Amanda also explains that there is another reason she would like to get away. I f***ing hate people. So yeah, Amanda uh, hates people, like she said, and it's a very prevalent part of this movie. I can't remember the last time I liked anybody. I hate people. I f***ing hate people. More on that later. We have a lot to get through. So we get this really long, like over two minute long, you know, opening credit scene. I didn't know that people still did this in movies. I kind of felt like it was a thing of the past. But weirder than that, weirder than its existence is the song that they chose. <laughs> Nick and I looked at each other watching this like, why? Why this song? But little did we know that many songs on this movie's soundtrack are just bizarrely wrong. I'm sure it was a deliberate, like, stylized choice, you know? But I hated it. This is the best Leave the world behind. Uh, <laughs> I'll see what they did there. So on the car ride to the rental house, we meet Amanda and Clay's kids. First one is the boy, Archie. Did you fart? And then we have Rose, who is a quite prominent character in this movie. There always has to be a creepy kid, you know? And the fun little quirk about Rose's personality is that she is obsessed with the show Friends. Dad, when we get back to the city, can you take me to see the coffee shop in Friends? I don't think that's real, honey. Uh, just a set. I cracked up at that conversation because I'm leaving for New York in two days and me and Nick had that exact conversation. I was like, can we go to Central Park? And he was like, I don't think that's real. Upsetting. So they make the drive in their beautiful blue car and they arrive at the beautiful big house just giggling as they head for the pool. <laughs> and as you can see by the big red words on the screen, this is part one, the house. I personally feel like it should have been spelled the house because that would have been cooler, but whatever. So they head in and they start to explore the house and we get yet another very weird song choice for the background music. Is that Blackstreet? <laughs> what business does a sexy romantic R&B song <laughs> have during this scene? The answer is none. None business. I do think a lot of the cinematography was very, very good in this movie. The The camera angles are really cool. It's it's just the music that was ruining it for me. So Amanda heads into town to go to the grocery store. <laughs> what do you guys say? Do you say grocery or groceries? I grew up saying groceries. Groceries is weird to me, but that's what she said. Groceries. Which is really weird because her, her nickname in Eat, Pray, Love was groceries. Sorry, sorry, what was I saying? Amanda heads to the grocery store uh, to buy groceries. Groceries. And as she's leaving, she sees Kevin Bacon loading a bunch of water into his truck. And don't forget that because it will come back later in a large way. So the family heads to the beach and this is right about when I asked Nick, is this an M. Night Shyamalan movie? Because I literally felt like I was watching old all over again. It's getting closer. What is? Shit. Uh, I was way off. This is not an M. Night Shyamalan movie, but I do feel like the director had to have been inspired by him or maybe they're friends or something. Maybe they get together and go bowling because it feels so M. Night Shyamalan. You're waiting for a big twist, even like the scene transitions and the music. It felt very similar to old, which you guys know I love. <laughs> so as the family is lounging in their blue clothes and Archie's getting pics from his girlfriend wearing a blue swimsuit while they're sitting next to a woman in another blue swimsuit, they realize there's a full blown ship an oil tanker coming straight at them and they need to make a break for it. So they run their little butts off past all the people in blue and all the blue stuff. <laughs> and I'm no beach expert, but wouldn't the ship have stopped like way, way sooner? You know, doesn't the sand, like here's the sand we can see, but then the sand goes on for a really long time. I'm just saying. Anyway, unless you pay super close attention to what this officer says very quietly, you will not have any earthly idea why this just happened. You know what happened? There's been a handful of these groundings up the coast, something to do with the nav system. I don't know, I'm just glad that Clay was able to save that umbrella that they left behind four seconds prior when they were running for their lives, you know? <laughs> he must have went back and grabbed it. So on the drive home from their near-death experience, Amanda wants some coffee. There's a Starbucks. <laughs> I guess Starbucks wanted some promotion in this movie. I Googled it. I Googled like Starbucks and leave the world behind because I was like, is anybody talking about this? It's kind of funny because a couple people talked about this on TikTok. I don't 
don't know why it's so funny. I guess I just feel like there's a time and a place, you know? There's a time and a place for Calypso music. There is a time and a place for Calypso music. Maybe don't choose the political, racially charged, apocalyptic thriller to advertise your coffee. I don't know. I wish it had been the oleado. <laughs> that would have made it okay. So that night they get a knock at the door and it is this gentleman here, George Scott and his daughter Ruth. And they explain to Amanda and Clay that they are actually the owners of the house. See, this is why I much prefer life before the internet because we would have spoken on the phone, we'd recognize my voice and known that this is our house. I kind of liked this part. It was quite uh, tense. You know, it held my attention. They finally chose the right music. Um, I think this is a cool shot here. And it's one of the only good scenes in the entire film because it makes you think something interesting is going to happen, but it doesn't. This is, this is your house? The goodness of the scene ends right about there. So Amanda is like a bit of a racist, I guess, and not that great of a person and really doesn't like people, you know, in case you forgot. I hate people. So yay for us that we get to watch all that unfold for two and a half hours. So George explains to them that they were actually driving home to their other house in the city when- Then something happened. A blackout. So I guess all the traffic lights had gone out and they felt like it would take them a good six hours to get back to their city apartment. <laughs> You want to stay here, but we're staying here. Well, under the circumstances, we, we thought you might understand. Well, George, she doesn't. Even if we ignore her being pretty clearly prejudiced, there's this whole other side where they haven't shown any proof that the house is theirs and they could easily be serial killers. Or I wouldn't necessarily trust anybody that just showed up and was like, this is my house. You want some sort of proof, you know? And maybe that's because we all watch too many true crime documentaries, but either way, she basically says, no, she's not comfortable. She's not feeling it. And so George responds with, May I? And he proceeds over to this locked liquor cabinet and opens a drawer that has a gun and an envelope in it with a thousand dollars. And he gives it to them like, here, here's a refund for half of what you paid for the inconvenience. And that's all good and great, but I thought it was so weird. Like they have him fiddle with the cabinet and like use the wrong key. And they went out of their way to show their gun and it just like builds all this tension and it just never comes back. I guess maybe it was to like make the audience wonder if he was trustworthy. I should have listened to my wife and had these labeled already. <laughs> it just felt I felt unresolved, you know? So Amanda and Clay have to discuss it privately where she alleges that these people are probably the help. Maybe he's the Handyman, she's the housekeeper. So just when George is explaining that he cannot provide any uh, identification because he left his wallet at the symphony, a national emergency alert comes on the TV. Emergency. Well, we're only talking about a blackout here. I think the only other movie I've seen that is this blue was Blonde Ambition. <laughs> Everything is blue. Like, look at these shadows on George's white shirt. I don't know what the blue symbolism is. And I'm too lazy to Google it right now. Let us know in the comments. Julia Roberts is completely blue. <laughs> All the other characters have like little hints of blue, but she's just. <laughs> Nothing says imminent danger like Julia Roberts as a Smurf. That's what I always say. Self-help cliches are rooted in some truth. Ooh, spooky. <laughs> I actually thought that was a cool touch. Not everything in this movie sucks. So the Scots end up going ahead and staying the night. They sleep in the in-laws quarters, AKA the basement. And the next morning, little Rosie wakes her mommy up because she still has not been able to finish the last episode of Friends. I was literally about to start the Friends series finale, but the internet on my iPad still isn't working. The kid's obsession with wanting to watch the last episode of Friends is another like symbolic, uh, part of the film, but I found it very out of place. Read the room, Rosie. There are more important things going on than a TV show. So this scene is where I did not notice this, but Nick actually noticed something quite fun, which is this mural here on the wall um, behind the master bed appears to have changed from how it looked in the beginning of the film. It's quite, you know, it's pretty obvious this was not a slip up or an accident. This is a deliberate choice as though to say, the tide is rising, the danger is escalating. And it was another thing that I thought was a pretty cool uh, directing choice. And very M. Night Shyamalan. Um. So Amanda gets a few news alerts on her phone that say that hackers are potentially behind the blackout because as we know, hackers be like, I'm in. <laughs> it doesn't say anything. What? Which is there? Goo! Goo! I'm sorry, can we take a closer look at your wallpaper photo? For a second there, it appeared as though Rosie had blue teeth. 
Oh, she does. Okay, she does. She does have blue teeth. So the director was so invested in the blue thing that he was willing to make a little bitty girl look like maybe she's been doing some breaking bad meth. Speaking of meth, we gotta take a break. <laughs> That didn't really make any sense. I'm not gonna go do math. I just needed a segue. But it is time for an ad break, unless of course you have YouTube Premium and then you'll just get a fuzzy TV screen, which if nothing else, I hope takes you back to your childhood for five seconds. Don't touch that dial. Raise your hand if this is the opposite of the facial expression you would make in this situation. A deer just emerged from the shrubbery and Rosie just kind of looks grossed out. She kind of looks like this. Ew, CGI deer are gross. Get ready you guys for the CGI deer because they are very in this movie. They are quite in this movie. And again, it's some sort of symbolism. It's like the animals know that something is happening. Not not that happening. We're just here to use the bathroom. Not that happening. Th this happening? A different happening. So the animals are being weird. But meanwhile, Amanda and the Scots are having coffee together. It is wildly uncomfortable, which I guess just means that the acting was really good. And I noticed that this black and white painting in the living room here hath changeth from how it looked in the beginning of the movie. So I read an article, this one was from Unilad, and the article said that the living room painting, which the filmmakers recreated and edited with permission from the artist, gets messier, like it's glitching more as time goes on. But then I saw this other creator on YouTube who did a review of this movie, and he felt that the black and white color of the painting was very significant um, because it represented the character's races or something. So who knows? What I know is that it was a very good reminder to me of why I absolutely hate modern art. I'm sorry, okay? It just looks, it looks like finger paint and it was probably a million dollars. So Ethan Hawke decides it's time for him to go explore. So he wants to head into town to find either a newspaper or a person to see if he can find out what's going on. But the GPS in the car doesn't work and he's not familiar with the area. So he just kind of is <laughs> driving aimlessly. <sighs> Stop it. He does meet a lady who clearly is in desperate need of help, but he can't understand her. She speaks Spanish. Okay, I, I don't understand what you're saying. I don't I don't speak um So instead of like trying to come up with a solution, he just dips out. Can you imagine can you imagine doing that to somebody? You couldn't open the passenger door and be like, uh Vominos? He's a dad. He knows the word Vominos. I guarantee he probably says it every time him and his family finish eating at a Mexican strong. You guys ready to Vominos? So while Clay is abandoning people on the side of the road, George is discovering the site of a plane crash. Yeah, he tried picking up this watch and he realized it was attached to a yucky arm. Uh -uh. And just then, only then, did he look to his left and suddenly see an entire beach littered with bodies. Most of us would have seen that right away, but we're not gonna nitpick. I didn't pick too much, I'm aware. So ships are beaching, planes are crashing, Ethan Hawke gets caught in a paper tornado. Another plane crashes again on the same exact beach and George barely makes it away with his life. While all of this terrible apocalypse stuff is happening, Amanda and Ruth are just chilling by the pool. You going in? No, you? Seems like a hassle. Why, because of your hair or? More like I don't trust that one of your kids didn't pee in the pool. Yeah, I highly doubt that either of the kids peed in the pool because they're off in a weird shed just talking about sibling stuff, you know? No one cares what I say. That's probably true. The brother, Archie, is so, <laughs> such a dweeb. <laughs> I hate his character. It's nothing against this young actor. His name's Charlie Evans. He's very good. He played a dweeb very good, but the character itself is... He's just... He takes all these creepy photos of Ruth without her consent, and he's mean to his sister. He, like, puts broccoli in her drinks and stuff. He's just... 
He's a bit of a chunt. Which is a cool word that I learned recently that I'm super into. Dante, do they have your permission to use that word? Dante didn't edit this part. It was me! It's Dante's word. He's a chunt! Did you fart? So all of a sudden, there is an ear-splitting, earth-shattering noise. Where are my kids? <laughs> The noise uh, appears to be far reaching, is affecting everybody in the area. So naturally they all take their palms and ever so slightly cover their ears over their hair. <laughs> As if you wouldn't fully put your fingers in your ear holes. So Amanda runs through the woods while lightly covering her ears to find her children. And the screen goes red and we find out that part three of this film is called the noise. But the hilarious thing is the noise never plays again in part three. So sort that one out. So Clay somehow makes it back to the house without GPS. And he's got this little red piece of paper because, you know, there was that drone that was in the sky dropping red sheets of paper. I can't remember if I told you that or not. But he shows it to the rest of the gang and Archie actually recognizes it to say, Death to America. I don't know what the rest of this means, but, but this part, it definitely means death to America. I remember from a game I was playing. What, uh... What game are you playing, Archie? So anyway, this whole death of America thing, this is like the last straw for the Sanfords. They are out of here. They pack their bags, they try to leave, but they can't escape because the only road out of town appears to be blocked by a bunch of brand spanking new Teslas with no drivers in them. Turns out this was the hackers, by the way. The hackers be to like, I'm in to the Teslas. They hacked the- They hacked the Teslas. And you know what? This was honestly the scariest part of the whole movie to me because I drive a Tesla and it's quite a weird thought to think that a hacker could be like, I'm in. And hack my tesla and drive it for me <laughs> that can't happen right so nick said that he heard that elon musk was highly offended at this scene because he felt like it was insulting to his company and according to this article the tesla founder was attempting to highlight that the cars could survive in an electric free apocalyptic situation but clearly he has not watched the film context is important elon it wasn't the car's fault it was the hackers who bead like I'm in. So anyway, the Samfords start getting attacked by killer Teslas and they have to whip a U-turn and they just gotta dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge on their way home to get away from them all and they finally end up back at the Scots. Just in time for part four of the movie, The Flood. And by the flood, they mean that it rains a little bit in part four. There's literally not a flood. Maybe there was one in the book, but not the flick, okay? I don't know what to tell you. Almost nothing happens in part four, apart from these flamingos landing in the pool. Those are flamingos. Other than that flamingo silliness, the only other funny parts to me in part four of the film were Rosie still being obsessed with friends and her brother being a big jerk about it. You're not going to see that show ever again. But my favorite part was Amanda and George having this pretty weird dance party. <laughs> You like yeah. that? Do you guys realize that the apocalypse is happening, kind of? Oh. Oh. Hmm. oh no. Hmm. Oh my. We're married. I'm married. Hold up. Are they suggesting that they were tempted to kiss each other? <laughs> Are you guys kind of French? Gross. They were totally gonna French. Imagine the world actually ending or your country being attacked or something and you're hiding out for dear life in a stranger's basement and you just decide to do a weird dance to Too Close. It's the apocalypse, everybody's dying. It's Armageddon, hackers be like I'm in, but we're dancing real weird and we yell at deer. This movie is boring. You guys remember dancing so hard to that song at nine years old and not realizing that it was about I do. On that note, friends, we have to take another short break and when we come back, the absolutely terrible conclusion of this film. Don't miss it. If the world falls apart, trust should not be dulled out easily to anyone especially white people. So all of a sudden Archie's teeth start like falling out, or I guess they're not really falling out as much as he just starts pulling them out. They did pretty good with this editing. I feel like it looks quite real, but the important thing is that he is clearly very sick with something suddenly. Archie, stop doing that. Yeah, stop doing that. 
my teeth. Why did he leave only one tooth in the front? I love how it took him pulling out eight entire teeth to finally look at his mom and be like, my teeth. My teeth. So now we enter into part five, the last one. Part, that is, the last part, Raffle. This is the part where little Rosie suddenly goes missing, but Clay and George have to take Archie to go see Kevin Bacon, who they assume will know how to treat his one tooth disease. My teeth. So the only people left to search for Rosie are Amanda and Ruth, who don't really like each other. And instead of searching for her, they just go in that same weird shed from earlier and yell at each other. Stop! yelling at me why are you like this every day all day my job my whole job is to understand people well enough so that i know how to lie to them so I hey amanda just a thought but your literal daughter is missing and it's armageddon so <laughs> Armageddon out of here. <laughs> well suddenly they snap out of it when a weirdly loud stampede of deer uh stampede i guess they don't really stampede but they do they just surround the shed and there's like eight thousand of them and i don't know exactly what i would do in this situation my first thought was like why are you afraid of deer deer are harmless but maybe it would be a little bit scary because there's a zillion of them and some of them are bucks and they could like buck you you know so i don't know exactly what i would do but i know for sure that i would not do this <laughs> There's a shed. You can go right inside. But also it's deer, right? It's not a pack of grizzly bears or a murder of crows. I love the <laughs> I love that the deer just stare at her like lady is scaring us. <laughs> Lady, you're scaring us. I'm gonna refrain from nitpicking the fact that these are not real deer because that's low hanging fruit. I get it. It's probably really difficult to round up eight thousand deer to make this point, but it is hilarious, okay? So while the girls are screaming at the deer, the fellows are with Kevin Bacon. I think his character's name's Danny. Danny is all knowing about this kind of thing. And Danny explains that Archie's teeth probably fell out because of the noise. Well, it's gotta have something to do with that noise. He explains that that horrific sound that we heard earlier was most likely a microwave weapon. A microwave weapons produces a kind of radiation that can be beamed out through sound. Uh Okay, it's radiation. Hmm. That would explain why literally nobody else is affected and they deliberately showed a scene earlier of Archie getting bit by a bug. A really gross bug, by the way. Anyway, they ask Danny for some medicine and he's like, no, in fact, instead I might actually kill you. But then after several very tense minutes, he's like, all right, you know what? Never mind, I'm not gonna kill you. And here's some radiation medication that I happen to have on hand for situations like this. I held on to it the last time the world ended. You know what I mean? I don't know how Kevin Bacon would say that. Held on to it. The last time the world ended. Hey, that was pretty good. That was kevin -y. He couldn't tell which. That was kevin bacon -y. He also suggests that they go find their neighbor's house, the Thorns, because he's pretty sure that they just built a apocalypse bunker in their basement. You try your neighbors, the Thorns. They did a basement doomsday bunker. What are the odds? <laughs> and lastly, he tells them that he's pretty sure there are several countries behind the attack. It's the Koreans, the Chinese, one of them. Maybe all this means is a few of them teamed up. And that right there is pretty much the only answer we get as to who is behind all this and who be like, I'm in. But still, it's speculative. You don't ever actually find out if it was the Koreans, if it was the Iranians. We will never know. So throughout this whole movie, there's a few moments where George seems to know something and he doesn't really want to share or he'll like share a little bit, but it doesn't really progress the plot at all. And finally, right here, just as they're about to pull away from Kevin Bacon's house, he explains to the guys that in his line of work, he had actually heard of a plan like this before that could collapse a government with three simple steps. First stage was isolation. Is Starbucks involved in that stage? Or? There's a Starbucks. But the second stage, synchronized chaos. So synchronized chaos would be to terrorize the target with covert attacks and misinformation so that without a clear enemy or a motive, people would start to turn on each other. And if done successfully, stage number three would happen on its own. What's the third stage? Civil war. So that, I guess, seems to be what's happening. And I, I have to admit, I was on the edge of my seat at this point. I was like, the climax is coming because there still hasn't been a climax two hours in. Meanwhile, Amanda and Ruth are still in the woods searching for Rosie and they find her bike path leading to this house, but they get distracted because they look across the water and see that New York is being blown up right just now. It was definitely unnerving to see that, but you don't really get to feel any emotion for very long because it immediately cuts to Rosie eating a bunch of cheesy poofs.
So it turns out when Rosie escaped, she took it on herself to enter into the Thorns house. Remember earlier when Kevin Bacon suggested they go to the Thorns house because they have a bunker in their basement? The Thorns. Well, they do. They have a bunker and Rosie found it. It's equipped with water, food, full spectrum lights, plants, a fake window, a working alert system, and wouldn't you know it, the last season of Friends on DVD. <laughs> And that is the end. Huh? First of all, I guess Rosie just couldn't care less where her family was during actual Armageddon. She's got friends. Second of all, huh? There's so many unanswered questions. Not in a good way. Not in a fun, mysterious way. I was so livid. I was livid watching this. And I was also mad because we also ordered Wingstop while we were watching this. And the DoorDash driver drove through my yard and made giant ruts. And the wings were cold. And it was overall a bad night. Where, pray tell, was the climax? And don't tell me that them screaming at the deer was a climax, okay? It wasn't. This is a two and a half hour movie, okay? Meaning there was endless fluff and kerfluffle in Hardunka Chud that could have been removed to make room for a climax or to make room for an actual ending that explained something. But no, no, it had to end so abruptly with the Friends theme song nonetheless. The Friends theme song. It doesn't fit. I'm getting stressed out. Let's read some reviews. The reviews on IMDb are pretty bad. Um, a couple of them I kind of liked. This one's called They Forgot to Film the Rest of the Movie. The premise is interesting, but as soon as the characters start to put the pieces together, the movie ends abruptly. It is one of the weirdest endings I've ever seen. The characters had only solved about 80% of the mystery, and it would have been interesting to know what would happen next. Still an enjoyable movie with a great cast. Mahershala Ali was phenomenal. I agree. He was really all the actors were good. Here's another good review called, Oh, the Calamity. What a pitiful, ham-fisted attempt at a slow burn to nowhere. I see awards on the horizon for most obtrusive soundtrack and worst blatant product placement at the tip of a catastrophe. So true. Oh my God, the world is ending. Ah. Ooh, Starbucks. There's a Starbucks. Me personally, I give it a solid five out of 10. Like I said, it was really good acting, good cinematography. I, I really wasn't plagued by this burning desire to turn it off halfway through. Nick was. Nick was very bored halfway through, but I was into it. But the plot never advanced, the ending never came, and the deer screaming was weird, but also hilarious. So friends, in conclusion, in my humble opinion, I think that we can leave, leave the world behind, behind. <laughs> I do fully understand, again, that there was a ton of symbolism in this and deeper meaning to this movie, but like I said in the beginning, I'm just not very deep. Thanks so much for being here, for watching. If you would like more content from me, um, I do have a vlog channel. I do have a Spanish channel, en espanol, for those of you who parle espanol. Wait, parle's French. Who habla, for those of you who habla espanol, uh, and you wanna check out my content in your native tongue, you can head to my Spanish channel, vlog channel. Uh, I do different content on Facebook. I'm just everywhere. You can't escape me, so. Thanks again for being here. I love you, friends. Leave your thoughts, questions, concerns, and injuries I should be aware of in the comment section down below, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace out. Why didn't anybody die? There should have been a death, right? Not that I, there should have been a death. It's the apocalypse. Everybody's dying, it's Armageddon, hackers be like Armageddon. Hold up, I actually still don't understand what the animals were doing. What were the deer- What were they doing? <laughs> Hold on you guys, something's tickling me. It's so itchy! It is so hot down here. The bird is screaming. The guys working on my patio overhang are hammering. It's 8.40 a.m., meaning I'm starting about um, three hours late. And what better situation to start filming a video? So satisfying. You're welcome. <sighs> okay. You know what's funny? I didn't know who Elon Musk was. I'm so detached that I didn't know who Elon Musk was until like two years ago, I think it was, when Kalel came to my house. Do you guys follow Kalel? She came to my house and she was like, are you, he's the Albert Einstein of our time. And according to the internet, this part is um, 
stupid because, and I quote, flamingos are wading birds that don't land in deep water and apparently they have to run for like a crazy long time before they can take flight. So we don't have Dance Dance Revolution, so you're dumb. <laughs> oh, this is so weird. I feel like I'm on another planet. Am I talking loud? I seem, I seem loud, I seem weird. 